eight years ago, I was entering the main lobby of Google when I encountered this scene. On the left, Tibetan monks were handcrafting a sand mandala, a traditional spiritual map of the universe. On the right was Google Earth, one of the most technically ambitious maps ever created. In this juxtaposition that spans space, time, and culture, I saw and felt how deep our need to make maps really goes. In the eight years since, I've been on a journey that first led me here to Boulder and then to the head of product for Google Earth. Along the way, I've had a lot of time to think about the meaning of maps. Map making is a practice at least as ancient as writing. And the reason I think is actually quite simple. Maps make the unknown known. Every time we step out into the wilderness to chart new territory, our understanding of who we are and how we fit into the wider world becomes a little bit clearer. Put simply, maps shape us, and then we shape maps. Map makers throughout the ages have been pioneering new techniques to render the world more faithfully. But they've been doing something else too, whether they knew it or not. They've been infusing the maps with the attitudes and beliefs of their day. And in that way, studying the history of maps gives us a fascinating window into our evolving worldviews. The first world map comes to us from Mesopotamia 2,600 years ago. Like all early cultures, Babylonians put themselves at the center of the world. Around them was a world ocean that none of them had ever crossed. Yet curiously, the map doesn't end there. Instead, there are these seven triangles which point to the uncharted worlds beyond the ocean. In the second century, Ptolemy was compiling the extensive reports of Roman surveyors spread out through the empire. He pioneered ingenious techniques at the intersection of math, astronomy, and geometry. And he was able to plot a whopping 8,000 locations onto a grid. This grid is the precursor to our modern-day latitude and longitude. And Ptolemy's atlas was so comprehensive that its authority went unchallenged for the next millennium. During the Middle Ages, Christianity was spreading across Europe. People's primary concern was no longer geographical accuracy, it was salvation. Accordingly, maps like the Epstorf map put Jerusalem at the center of the world. And instead of a world ocean, the world was surrounded by the body of Christ. During the so-called Age of Discovery, maps became tools of conquest. Monarchies were stretching their empires, New borders were being drawn every day as the world map filled in fast. Map makers like Gerard Mercator were inventing techniques that made it easier to cross an ocean and say plunder the new world. Mercator's map was so influential that for the next 400 years, it was still our canonical map. But this map has a glitch. In order to make seafaring easier, Mercator had to stretch the size of land masses closer to the poles. This means that Europe was drawn the same size as South America, even though it was only half the size. Africa was drawn the same size as Greenland, even though Africa was 14 times larger. In 1974, historian Arno Peters wanted to correct this bias and introduce the world to his now famous Peters projection. Peters was showing us how maps are more than just maps, how they have the power to shape how we view the world. Around the same time, another historic event was unfolding that would reshape how we saw ourselves and how we made maps. It was Christmas Eve, 1968, and astronaut Bill Anders decided to take an unscheduled photo from Apollo 8. For the entirety of human history up until that point, our view of our planet was shaped by the map maker's hand. Earthrise was the first time we had a truly cosmic vantage point, and it was thrilling. Here we were, the shimmering jewel, free of any borders. Earthrise, along with the equally iconic blue marble a few years later, changed how we saw ourselves. One astronaut described this as the moment we developed a global consciousness. Google Earth is the spiritual descendant of that ancient art of map making 
and this new kind of space photography. Applications like Google Maps use a more traditional cartographic style. But Google Earth asked the question, can you build a map with photos? So how is Google Earth made? Well, put simply, it's created from imagery captured from three vantage points, from space, from the air, and from the ground. The secret sauce is the technology that stitches these disparate images into one seamless experience. It starts in space. When you open up Google Earth, you're greeted with imagery called Pretty Earth. It's an homage to the blue marble. But while the blue marble was a single photo, the deceptively simple Pretty Earth is actually composed by analyzing 700 trillion pixels from NASA's Landsat satellite. Just to put that into perspective, that's more pixels than there are stars in 5,000 Milky Ways. The best 8 billion pixels are then extracted, aligned, color corrected. The result is an image of the planet that's cloud free and springtime everywhere. <laughs> I like to think of this as Mother Earth's best selfie. <laughs> as we start our descent from space, features start popping up from the ground. Despite the naysayers, the Earth is not flat. And effort. <laughs> I'm the Google Earth guy. Hopefully, hopefully, I didn't offend any flat earthers. <laughs> so, efforts to add 3D buildings to the map actually started right here in Boulder with a program called SketchUp. Fast forward to today, and with the advent of a technique called photogrammetry, we can now render entire 3D cities in one fell swoop. The technology is getting so advanced that we can actually model complex natural landscapes in rich detail. Our final stop is Street View. Street View allows you to feel what it's like to be there, to say, enter Mackie Hall, or to look up at the ceiling of the Sagrada Familia, or to hike down the Grand Canyon, or to chill with snow monkeys in Japan, if that's your thing. <laughs> Photographers from every nation have been adding 360-degree imagery to the map, and I like to think of these intrepid explorers as our modern day Roman surveyors. So now we have this map filled with so many photos you probably couldn't see the whole thing in a lifetime. And the question becomes, what do we do with it? Well, my question to you is, what did you do the first time you opened up Google Earth? Did you go home? It's OK, we all did it. <laughs> and it's actually endearing in a way. Because every time I've seen someone find home, and I've witnessed this now hundreds of times, the next thing they do is turn to me with a spark in their eye to tell me about where they're from. And I get to learn a little bit about who they are. And in this way, photo maps have the power to create empathy and connect us. One of the things I'm most proud of in Google Earth is a feature called Voyager. Voyager is an interactive storytelling platform with the aim of making the world a smaller place. One of my favorite stories is called This is Home. And it's a twist on that idea. Instead of our home, we get invited into the homes of people from around the world. And so imagine being a kid from a city and getting to step into a Peruvian reed hut, or into a Mongolian yurt, or into a Sherpa's home at the base of Mount Everest. These stories have the power to show us how life differs across region and place, but more importantly, how it's the same. So beyond empathy for people across borders, photo maps can actually give us empathy for the planet itself. Pretty Earth was a single image, but what if we could see the world change over time? How would that shape our behavior, and what would we do differently? Using a technology called Earth Engine, Earth time lapse reveals a rapidly changing planet over the last 30 years. We see how Mother Earth is alive and breathing and evolving, and in some cases, dying too. Images are very powerful. What words could explain away these melting glaciers, or these vanishing lakes, or these rainforests being clear-cut? The good news is, if we use this technology responsibly, we can track things like deforestation, changing waterways, air quality, overfishing, and the spread of disease. 
we can monitor the vital signs of the planet and together create a healthier future. Returning to our friends in the lobby of Google, after finishing their intricate sand mandala, they swept it away in a ceremony that acknowledges the impermanence of the world. Things change, maps change, Google Earth has changed, and Google Earth has helped reveal a little bit about how the planet is changing. And while you might think that Google Earth is an ambitious undertaking, it's actually just a small step in the evolution of map making. And that's the thing about maps. This is the deeper secret that they reveal. It's not about the places we've been, it's about the places we have yet to go. It's the blank spaces that provoke us to keep exploring. Today, those blank spaces include all the planets beyond the oceans of space. So with that in mind, I'd like to leave you with this. If maps have the power to shape us, who will we be when we finally step out to map the universe? Thank you. Thank you.